Okay. Welcome back uh, to our second keynote uh, here this afternoon at SILIP Conference 2017. Have you had a good day so far? Yes. Fantastic. I'm tempted to do the pantomime thing, but we won't. Uh, we'll keep it moving. Um, but I am really, really excited to be in introducing uh, this keynote. He's someone whose work uh, I have a very strong personal interest in. I think a lot of the work uh, that he's doing, some of the questions he's asking uh, about the fundamental basis of, of what we do as information professionals, the tenets of information philosophy, are, are helping us to build a new picture of why all of this matters. Uh, so please join me in giving a very warm, very enthusiastic welcome to Professor Luciano Floridi. I think the music was, uh, was meant for my age. Um, <laughs> those of you who re recognize that kind of music, uh, wrong side of the divide. <laughs> um, welcome to the afternoon session. I have a confession to make, uh, and you will see that uh, it's a true confession. I was so happy to receive this invitation that I got overly excited. And I broke uh, one of the rules that I'm so furious when my students break it. One talk, one idea. And they say, oh, no, no, but I have so many things to say. All this. No, 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 no. I said, but I have 45 minutes. I don't care. Then, then you explain that, that idea for 45 minutes, and they will be grateful for that. And so, um, as you will see, I've actually decided a long time ago that I could surely present three ideas. Uh, because, no, the professor makes the rules, but then they breaks, uh, uh, breaks the rule at the same time. And then I realize, no, I, I can't do that. Uh, no, because um, I've also been told we are recording this. And what if my students see this? Uh, it, it can't be done. So I will, in the end, despite all the excitement, and therefore all the things I would like to share and discuss, above all, with you, I will stick to the rule one idea. Although with a few tricks here and there. So a big idea, as you were. So full of little ideas here and there. Um, but you will see that um, uh, two other topics that I wanted to cover today with you, uh, I shall not. And trust me, for a philosopher to have slides there that you can't show, uh, it's a real torture. But of the three topics that I wanted to share with you, uh, and the slides should help us, uh, they will be in the... Uh, slides in a moment, I will, as I said, cheat a little bit and provide a bit of background of what do you mean by this fostering the infosphere, how do we get here, the information revolution, what do we do with information, what's the role of uh, no, the uh, sort of professionals who have been with us for so long, uh, not just you, I mean, the journalist, uh, the, anyone in the knowledge slash information management uh, side. Uh, but also people who had um, a sale and, and a business in books and so on. So anyone who had a role in the information sort of business, how did we get to the point where we define our society as the information society, and yet those are the people who are under the highest level of pressure, including something called experts, which is a bad word today. Like, you know stuff out of here. Like, it's just, we deal only with rhetoric. So I'll, I'll, I'll tell you how we got here, uh, how we got to this particular position uh, with a bit of background, and it will be very quick, because I know that you know, so it's just a post-coffee, let's be on the same page. But uh, having sort of um, somewhat uh, cheated there, um, that's the idea I would like to introduce. Um, and uh, I will have to deal a little bit with uh, this strange word that we have in English, to cleave, uh, which is an unusual word, uh, uncommon in any other uh, European language. More on this in a moment, but once we have a bit of history how we got here, I would like to tell you why the digital is making such a big difference in a variety of contexts, especially for, say, the library and information science community, defined under the cleaving power. Then. That's the real idea that I want to share with you. The struggle between who has power today 
and who had power yesterday. And how essentially people like us here are sort of caught in the middle. Uh, I'm being vague on purpose, otherwise I'm giving away the story and you would not start checking your emails. But so uh, hold your breath, uh, uh, stay with me. Um, but there will be a story to tell in terms of uh, why uh, library and information science has a power related political role to play, uh, which is quite crucial and it's not new either. I will not speak about memory. I told you, uh, that was one of the ideas I wanted to cover, but nope, not today. And I shall not speak about curation either. Uh, not because it's not important, but because I think that whatever I would like to say about these two points would follow from the power discussion. And therefore, I'd rather have another meeting at another time, or maybe after, uh, during the break, or during the Q&A, but I don't want to rush through the point number three just to get to four and five quickly. The conclusion will be very quick. So let me just give you the background. And um, the background is made of uh, five arrows. Simple. And uh, uh, the five arrows that have brought us here within the lapse of a generation. And by the way, if you are too far away, you don't even have to try to read what I'm going to show. All you have to look at is the arrow. So this amazing arrow in terms of um, computational power, uh, more slow, I know that you know, it's just a reminder. It goes up and up and up. I know there are questions about whether it will start sort of uh, um, becoming less uh, aggressive uh, in the future, but surely that's what we have experienced in the past. There's another arrow which calculates the number of people connected online. And that makes a huge difference because essentially the more we are online, the more our experience becomes an on-life experience. And remember, that online is where any other digital agent is at home. We, as I said elsewhere, we scuba dive. They, they're the fish. Because the digital world, where the digital interacts with the digital at home. And therefore, we're just joining you now this immense migration. And if you can see this from far away, on the y-axis, these are billions of people connected, one way or another. Power, people online, lots of things talking to each other. Just in 2015, we produce every second, if I wait another bit longer, that's two, three, four seconds, 13 trillion transistors. It's even hard to start conceiving how many transistors we produce in one year. Where do they go, all these transistors? Well, things, cars, your appliances at home, yeah. uh, the stuff that you have in your pocket. And therefore, that's what we call Internet of Things. Uh, if it is true, but no, depends on whom you're talking to, that by 2020, 2050, numbers are also a bit random here, uh, we're going to have no, tens of billions of things connected. Well, what's going to happen is that um, communication on this planet is already and will increasingly be a question of machine to machine. Not in terms of quality, I'm not talking about Shakespeare. I'm, them, I'm talking about quantity, massive amount of data moving from A to B, from B to C, and it's all about machine communication. We passed that threshold between 2003 and 2010, and by the time we get to 2020, there will be maybe perhaps about 50 billion uh, things talking to each other, uh, roughly six or seven per person in the whole world which means that everybody here will have probably three times that amount of things around us talking to each other. It's the kind of experience that if you go home, you, saw all the, you see all these lights somewhere, green, blue, red, going tru -tru 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 -tru. That's, that's the sort of infosphere breathing. Inevitably, all this has generated an enormous amount of data. And I know that you know, it is again more data from Cisco. I borrowed these slides from uh, a recent meeting we had together. And the numbers are a little bit too roundy to be credible, uh, from zero to 4.4 zettabytes in 2013. Zero meaning when we were scratching cows on the walls of a cave, okay? That, that kind of zero. 
Um, and then in a number of just a handful of years, 4.4, 44. Mm. That's a bit too roundy. But even if they are wrong by 10%, even 20%, what is written there must be the truth. Essentially, all the data we have, again, I'm talking about quantity, not necessarily quality, has been generated by us, the living generation. And that tsunami has been created by us, not before and not anyone else. There's only one arrow that goes down, and that's the cost of all this. Cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. And I put Commodore 64 there because otherwise that jingle at the beginning wouldn't match with my age. Uh, well, that's, that's, that's how things are going down. So altogether, why do we need a concept to organize all this? Well, because all, all this up and down has, um, stay with me, restructured concepts and phenomena that we thought were either atomic, like blocks that we couldn't unglue, no, we didn't even think about it, or molecules that of course were independent of each other and didn't make a block. This metaphor will be clear in two slides. But start thinking in terms of cleaving as that funny word that does two things at the same time. And because I'm told that we are recording this, I will not crack any joke about our politicians today, you know, being as confusing as that word. You know, so, uh, you know, I will never call for an election, and then the day after, no, election. Like, so which way are we going? Um, but, so, but, but those are bad jokes that are not on record. Uh, we, we shouldn't use those words. Um, um, to cleave, therefore, is as confusing as no, contemporary politics because um, it comes from two German words that at some point were sort of fused in a single word because the spelling was lost. Kleben and kleben, one means to cut through, the other one is to stick or cling. And of course, that doesn't really go hand in hand. However, we do have a word today which is cut and paste. Well, that's, that's what cleave means here. To cut and paste in one word, or if you are a philosopher, to re-ontologize, and that's the only scary moment during the whole lecture, uh, to re-ontologize the very essence of what you're touching. The next slides represent an example of what I mean, and they should bring home this cleaving power. So once we have a bit of background, those are arrows, the cleaving power of the digital that has been cutting and pasting stuff that was blocks or independent in a reshaped world, well then we are ready to talk about power and information. So the digital cleaving power. Well think in terms of presence and location. Well this is something that all generations before ours has never considered independent of each other. You are located somewhere and you are present there, meaning that you interact there where you are located. Unless you are in a science fiction movie or some kind of mythological story by Homer. But in the real world, we, humanity, has always experienced that as an atomic thing, a single block. Today, the digital separates the two independently. Uh, say, well, why does it matter? Well, because that's exactly why people don't come to the library. Because they look, a library for example, but that's also true for a, a bank branch, um, is a place organized around the identity between where you are, that's where you interact. So if you want to have a book, this is the place where you get it, so to speak. Well, once you start splitting that, and you split that radically, dramatically, forever, well, surely, no, I can interact with things, be present somewhere without being located there. And so places which were thought to be for location plus presence, today are places that generate or handle only location. They're not places for presence, and unless you reinvent those places for presence, not just location, you're out of business. Next thing you know, you open a bar because that's the only thing that actually you can have experience of where you're located plus present. You can't have a cappuccino virtually, okay? And that seems to be obvious today, of course, yeah. trivial, obviously. That's what you do in a library, or yes, you do it for a, a, a branch of a bank. Ownership and usage. Well, that's also 
something that we have split today. Netflix, Airbnb, Uber, but also Amazon. Because we know in this room, but most people don't outside this room, that when you buy a digital book from Amazon, you didn't own anything. So much so that you can actually not sell it as a second-hand digital book to anyone else. You are renting it for as long as it takes. In other words, you have a right to use, but you don't have a right to own. And remember that that unity has been with us since at least John Locke, when we define in this corner of the world ownership as the right to exclude anyone else from the usage of this stuff, which I own, therefore. So you can see that the two have always been hand in hand, but now totally unglued. The gluing. Well, this has been with us since the 80s, so it's old news, and that's why I know that I'm just reminding you. Uh, so don't take this as, oh, surely not. He knows that I know. Yes, I do. Uh, the, so the prosumer, the prosumer, the idea that we produce and consume stuff, say, on YouTube, we are the people who put the stuff there and the people who consume the stuff put there, or on Facebook. Well, that has been uh, increasingly a combination of the two to the extent that uh, the data, again, from Amazon in terms of self-publishing are staggering. At this point, you know, who needs a publisher when I can actually do all in my hand, in my computer, and be the producer-consumer cycle? The offline-online divide, there was a very short time. I, I like to call it the modem era. And during the modem, without the R, uh, era, there was a divide between the online and the offline. Today, that modern era is way past, and we just have an experience on life. To the extent that um, anyone who has a smartphone in hair or his pocket probably has an average of 20 apps, and um, usually, um, on average, every app sends your location once every second. So every second that you know, we'll be spending here, your location has been some signal, uh, 20 times, and that's 24 seven. So thinking that, no, I'm not online, of course not. Yes, you are, you just don't know. Uh, so the online experience is becoming uh, pervasive, and uh, again, if you follow a GPS while driving, well, that's online, offline. If you ask that question, you, know, you must be from the 90s. In other words, you have not quite realized where you are, which is where these two things by now mix. And that mixing, mixing together, is also this thing that I've been calling you know, infosphere for some time, where the analog and the digital are totally in one unity. Today, a car is much more a computer on wheels than anything else. Uh, so, inevitably, we need to rethink some of the concepts here. I could go on, but those five are the ones that seem to me closer to our own uh, problem today. We could talk about law and territoriality, agency and intelligence, authenticity and memory, etc. But let's stop here because I think that those examples should be sufficiently clear to illustrate that simple tool that we're going to use. Cut and paste, and that's what the digital does, to blocks that we have inherited, either as ideas or phenomena from the past. But what about power? Well, this will require a few long steps, so bear with me, because uh, we will come to the point uh, just in a few slides. We take it from afar, and it's a simple point. Uh, that's, uh, uh, for the non-philosophers in the room, this is a classic trick. No, the philosopher is always talking with something absolutely obvious. So, something like uh, Brexit is Brexit. No, like, okay. <laughs> Uh, I, it's hard to sort of have something to object to that, so tautology, or uh, enough is enough. Yes, yeah, yeah, that's, that's also true. Right? So um, if you work with that kind of uh, A is A, I mean, you're very Aristotelian. You're not going anywhere, but no, you're very Aristotelian. I mean, identity, no. Um, so let's start from simple, in a sort of, there is a May kind of uh, lesson. Uh, uh, and. Uh, Information, what is information? Well, one way of presenting it is, is an answered question. And I know the reaction is, oh, well, thank you so much. I know, exactly, so, 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 precisely. Yeah. So if you don't question that, we're already on, 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 on a good foot. You've got a question, you've got an answer, and that makes you, you know, uh, the I there. So Alice is informed if she has the Q and the A. If she has what is the capital of France plus 
Paris, and she's informed that Paris is the capital of France. Fine. This helps us to describe her uncertainty. The uncertainty is when she has only the question, but not the answer. She wonders, what was the capital of uh, Germany in uh, 1998? Was, that, was it already reunifica reunification, the war? I'm not quite sure. Was it Berlin born? So maybe two, uh, I'm not quite sure. So I don't have the answer, or may have the answer, but I'm not so sure, because Paris has been there for a while. Um, so she has the question, but not the answer. The other thing that we can describe now is also her ignorance. She doesn't have the question. She never wonders, so, oh, what if? If she did, she wouldn't be ignorant. She would be uncertain. <laughs> Let me describe this with a true Alice. This is um, a video game uh, which I hope you haven't seen because uh, it's Alice going totally insane. She's running out of an asylum with a big knife killing everybody. Okay? <laughs> that's, that's, that's a new Alice for you. Uh, so Alice, uh, who is insane, uh, uh, is looking for a monster. So there are things that she knows. There's a monster hiding, and she's afraid. So that's, that's her information. That's the Q&A and the A in one go. Then there are things that she knows she doesn't quite know. Where is the monster hiding? And that's her uncertainty. She knows there is one, but she doesn't know where. And then there are things that she doesn't even know that she doesn't know. And that there's a magic sword somewhere that would kill the monster. He says she doesn't even have the question, is there a magic sword? So you can tell that this is quite useful because uh, at this point, and trust me, we're going to get to power, but bear with me. And yes, even to library information science. So imagine that the Q and the A all together, all the whole world of information, the ultimate Wikipedia is the available information, the information out there, independently of whether we have or do not have access to it. It's the you know, um, library or uh, Bible and, or whatever picture you want to imagine. Now take Alice. Alice, information, is the fragment in this whole world according to which she has access to the questions and the answers. Remember, the whole thing is Q plus A. Then there's another corner where she has access of this whole universe only to one side, the question side. All that is the information potentially available to Alice. The question and the answer that she has and the question that she has without the answers. And she can go because there's available information out there to get the answers if she wants. You start you know, recognizing things here, I hope. And then there's a whole universe on the other side of the wall, which is her ignorance. And there she has access neither to the question nor to the answers. Now remember that that wall, if you transform Alice into humanity, is something that we cannot even imagine, we do not know, as a whole agent on this planet. It doesn't mean that it doesn't get erased constantly, but it does mean that we, as a full, major, big agent, are living in a bubble, inevitably, that we try to prick and push or transform, but that will, will never disappear. It will never disappear because, by definition, there are questions that we haven't even thought we should be asking in the first place. It also doesn't mean that we cannot make no, that wall sort of move further. So in this interplay, here is the concept of power that I want to introduce. Who controls the kind of access that Alice has to the answers to the question that she has? She has a question about who is controlling access to that wall that could answer those questions. Her uncertainty, in other words, remember uncertainty as having a question without having the answer. And I told you, the usual trick in philosophy. I was always getting way, way more complicated than I thought. Uh, told you, it wasn't Brexit, it's Brexit kind of business. Uh, or oh, actually is. Uh, uh, way more complicated. Um, well, in that context then, uh, someone is controlling her uncertainty. Maybe herself, maybe someone else, but that is a matter of power. Almost there. Because now we have uncertainty, we know what uncertainty has got to do with power, we need to define power, and then we're ready to do the rest of the work.
Power here is the sociopolitical ability to control or influence people's behavior. Basically, make people do what you want them to do. No. Push, pull, nudge, whatever it takes. No. With a gun, with a carrot, with a stick, uh, with a bit of extra taxes, no taxes, I don't know which way, we put them there, no, no, sorry, it was a mistake. Um, no, we put them again, uh, but uh, whatever way you decide at some point, I, I hope that whether no, we, we do pay for that or not, uh, and whom is paying, well, at some point you try to modify people's behavior. So let's take now the other element and finally put everything together. Library and information science. Libraries included. And remember that I have in mind here both the sort of cultural uh, discipline and the sort of almost physical institutions. I like to put that everything into one big block, uh, if you allow me. As democratic institutions within a sociopolitical role to counterbalance the power out there, as the ability to control and influence people's behavior. In other words, if we are in the business of answering questions, and there's an exercise of power in terms of who controls what access do I have to what answers given my questions, how do I make sure that that power has a counterbalance in terms of uh, a democratic availability of answers? Do we really want to live in a world where essentially only some people have control of the answers to the questions? This may sound a little bit too um, theoretical at the moment, but in the following slides, it should get easier and easier, and at some point, quite pragmatic. Assume for a moment that the role of library and information science is defined by the nature of power it is expected to counterbalance. Once we have a clear understanding of that power, then we also know what counterbalance is provided by the discipline and its institutions. So back to the power that we have defined before. In the past, power was exercised in terms of power over people, over you, over me, was exercised in terms of control of things or information about things. It could be the barons, you know, 19th century, the Carnegie and the Mellon and the Rockefeller and so on, or it could be the mass media a little bit later. But anyone who has either controls for the few Marxists in the room on the means of production or controls the information about the means of production, or then has control on the behavior of the individuals down the road. So at some point, and that's how we developed what was correct, but also in my view now, uh, limited conception of libraries, for example, as warehouses, in a context where power is exercised on people's behavior in terms of control over things, well, how do you counterbalance that if not having someone else controlling things on the other, and therefore putting, say, libraries as huge sort of reservoir of, say, documents out there. So in this case, what uh, the role was, still is, but it is becoming less prominent, is to take care of free accessibility to things, documents or information about things, documents of what the documents are about. Remember, we want to control Alice's uncertainty. We do that by controlling the answers. The answers are controlled by those in the past who would be in the production of things, in the production of information, and therefore, as a counterbalance, a society would generate the movement of uh, public libraries in the United States, which had a democratic so, uh, political agenda. And what happens when power changes? So if this mechanism of kind of power, counterbalance, power of things and information, therefore power as counterbalance in terms of documents and accessibility to documents and meta information, etc. But what if these days power is no longer exercised in terms of control of things and information, but something else? How do we cope with that? And you're still remembering that uncertainty in the back, huh? don't, don't give up. Because we need to ask, and it's almost there, no, it's probably the, the last bit I ask you to uh, um, sort of indulge me in. <coughs> Now that we know what uncertainty is, what's the relationship between power and uncertainty, and the fact that it's this sort of balancing act, what if power changes? How do we rebalance that particular act? So what is power in a mature information society? Because if that has changed, then the countervailing, the counterbalancing sort of power also has to change. 
Well, the politics of uncertainty, remember, no, whom controls the answers to my questions? In a context where we have amazing amount of cheap goods and basically free information cannot be exercised in terms of control of information and cheap goods. This is something that uh, one understands immediately when uh, you understand the power that Amazon has over publishers. Amazon, which doesn't produce the books, assuming that the books is the only thing that we want to think about when Amazon is in question, has an enormous uh, power over publishers which actually produce the stuff, because producing the stuff is no longer what gives you power. So what is that gives you power? Well, the ability to control the questions that generate the information about things. So in the amount of, in a few decades, we move in terms of um, exercise of power from I control you because I control things, to I control you because I control information about things, to I control you because I control the questions that generate the information about things. That should start sounding familiar in terms of who controls the questions. So power is exercised today about which questions can be asked and what answers can be received. So all issues that you find listed there, which are daily discussed, at least within my circle, transparency, privacy, right to be forgotten, freedom of speech, ownership rights, and so on, you can start looking at them from this particular angle. The angle is that uh, power in material information societies is not just about things, is, or information about things, it's about uncertainty, questions, shaping answers, giving rise to information about things. And if this movement three steps remote seems to be a little bit too abstract, I think a bit of George Orwell, no, 1984, should help. Just slightly modified, but not too much. In material information society, the morphology of power becomes the morphology of uncertainty. In other words, how you manipulate the ways in which we satisfy our questioning becomes the way in which you control my life. And who's control the questions shape the answers. But who shapes the answers controls reality. Another way of putting it is that um, contrary to expectations and whatever propaganda one may ex might be exposed to, Google, for example, is not a library catalog in any possible way. It's actually the map of a territory in a context where the map is all that counts. And if it's not on a map, it doesn't exist in the territory. Which is just another way of saying that those who control the questions controls the answers, and those who control the answers controls reality. And what's the role here, therefore, the counteracting role of, uh, in all this? Well, the role of library information science and libraries in, in general, in our information society, remember, was to counterbalance their power. Where we were selling things, we were accumulating books. When we started you know, thinking in terms of mass media, we started developing library and information science. But now that the power is no longer exercised in terms of things and information about things, but it's exercised in terms of the sources, the questioning behind, how can we sort of counterbalance that? Well, in this particular case, what we need to do is to uh, counterbalance that in terms of people's behavior through uncertainty by guaranteeing and facilitating, of course, the free and effective formulation of questions. And that's a bit of a change. So, uh, at least I grew up in some corners thinking that the profession, insofar as I was exposed to it, was about the stuff, the information. It wasn't about the questions generating the stuff. But in a world where power is one step remote, that's where we need to have a counterbalance uh, moment. Almost at the end, so we can start relaxing. From a systemic perspective, therefore, we need to ensure that the politics of uncertainty remains fair. And from an economic perspective, we need to break the monopoly on the control of uncertainty. Now, if you want to put this in more sort of ordinary uh, terms, this means that all the media that are controlling the questioning should not disappear and should not be undermined, but should receive a counterbalance from society and politics in terms of a, a different alternative view or a different access to the same questions. Remember, I'm not talking about the answers. I'm talking about what questions we can actually ask and how easily.
if we have this um, counterbalancing out, then the cut and paste here I started with should help. Remember I said at the beginning, um, just one thought, which was this thought about power. From one perspective, which is the cut and paste of the digital. The digital has um, cutting and pasting stuff that we thought will never be cut or pasted together. I'll give you a few examples. In this particular case, it has sort of uh, unglued the question from the answering. Today we have plenty of examples around us where essentially the whole business is about, shall we say, query or search, and not about answering. It's about providing means to ask questions. It's there that the ungluing means that power has shifted to control of the uncertainty. Remember, question without answer. Insofar as I have business and models to control that particular morphology, that is exactly where I am exercising the highest level of power. Not surprisingly, for example, uh, uh, Google, uh, well, that was before it became Google and Alphabet, uh, was uh, one of the highest sort of investors in terms of lobbying the government, the US government, until recently. In a way that it was either comparable or higher than uh, the army industry, the oil industry. So when you start, and these are data available to anyone, it's not a particular secret. Uh, so who is lobbying whom for how much in the US uh, sort of uh, pol political arena? And all of a sudden you realize that all this sort of philosophical thinking is cutting way more deeply. Because if you are lobbying for amount of monies that are higher than the army industry, you can start thinking that the influence is deep. And it's all about questioning, it's not about answering. So in this particular case, uh, and I said uh, I'm coming definitely to the last slide of, of my talk, what we should be thinking more carefully about is who controls the questioning in the first place, which then gives rise to the rest of the thing. And who controls the questions, as I told you, controls the answer and then controls reality. Now at that point is where I realized that, as you can tell, it's almost 35 minutes. The other two ideas really weren't going to get much of a chance. So let me stop here with a final uh, sentence. The sort of work that we are involved with, and it's not just library information science, here certainly, but also in the knowledge sort of society, the knowledge management, is not just to take care of the past for the present, but it's also to take care of the present for the future. And this means, in less sort of a catchy phrase, ensuring that future questioning will have the resources accumulated and curated today to be properly handled, which means to provide a counterbalance to anyone else who's actually controlling the questioning today. And with that, I thank you for your attention. Uh, what an extraordinary summary of a very complex but extremely important area for our profession. So uh, Luciana has very kindly agreed to take questions from uh, the audience today. So I was wondering if anybody uh, has a question, if you wouldn't mind saying who you are, uh, where you're from, and then sharing your question with us. Uh, who would like to kick us off? Who would like to dispute the theory of inequality of power and information? <laughs> I mean, I had one, if I may, while, while you're thinking. Not where about Theresa May, please. No. no okay. Well, it's kind of obliquely. Uh, so we talk a lot about our role as librarians in serving customers, this role as, as service, and about the impartiality of, of that role. But some of what I take from your argument here and, and elsewhere is that it's not sufficient just to serve, to, to meet an expectation, that we're talking about a more activist role for the information professional, not just in helping people to understand the inequality of power, but giving them the tools to take back control, if you like, of that power. So is that the shift you see in our role? I think so, and uh, I, I, even if I may generalize in terms of accusation, <laughs> uh, the, the, the sort of um, mistake that we made in the past, in the past few, uh, few years was to lower our guard, uh, precisely in, in terms of thinking that the job was done, 
that, for example, the public is eager to know uh, uh, that uh, all you, we had to do was at different levels in different contexts, from so the from school to library to uh, desk to university, was to be available and be sufficiently objective and uh, so reasonably open-minded, and then people would come, and then uh, society would be moving in the right direction. Um, I don't know if anyone. I hope not. You shouldn't, but in case you remember how the first line of the metaphysics by Aristotle opens, ah. of course, every day, like the, the first thing you read in the morning, um, is um, before coffee. Um, so all men by nature desire to know. Not true. No. Well, it's simply not true. I mean, of all the things that Aristotle said, that is false. Because, of course, all men by nature desire to go on holiday. Right? Yeah. <laughs> so, and, and to know, unfortunately, now this no, desire for knowledge is an acquired taste. So of course, if you are uh, Aristotle, uh, who just went to school you know, because the teacher was called Plato and his teacher was called Socrates, you get in that, in that bubble. You think, oh, you know, of course, all men by, this, you know, by nature desire to know. But then you just walk out of the street, for goodness sake, you know, get into a shop, dear Aristotle, and realize that, no, that's not true. We've got other interests, other things, other passions. So knowledge is an acquired taste. And therefore, you know, the objectivity of the service that we provide is becoming insufficient. Uh, just to cite, no, 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 quote some, someone a little bit more famous than, than sorry, uh, Jesus. Uh, he said, you know, at some point, he said, you remember the story, you know, organizing a party, yeah. and uh, you know, it's a great party, you know, sends the servants, the servants come back, and he says, they don't want to come. And then he says something terrible that you know, we build the crusades on. He says, force them to enter. Go out, get those people, and force them to enter. Now, forcing to enter maybe you know, is a bit too strong. Not that I want to criticize Jesus, but it sounds like a little bit sort of on the stark side. Um, but a robust invitation, shall we say, to get more informed, I think these days is, is, is overly due. Yeah. Absolutely. Very true. Um, so, any further comments, questions? Yes, Naomi. Hi, thank you very much indeed um, for your presentation. Um, I was um, interested about the um, three um, aspects to your model involving Alice. And I would suggest that with the implementation of the general data protection regulations, and particularly the right to be forgotten, there's a fourth aspect, which is that Alice asks the question and doesn't like the answer. Yes, um, I'm afraid that that is um, again uh, been a long story, um, uh, which is normally what <laughs> what I also te teach my students: never ever ask the question if you do not like you know, the answer you're going to get, because you know, sometimes you know exactly. And some people well, they just ask the answer, hoping that the the answer that you would like to receive is coming. Um, it's like me asking my wife whether I can have extra chocolate. I know that, you know, what the answer is going to be, uh, but I ask anyway. Um, you're right. I mean, in, in a way, uh, some of the answers uh, that we get are uh, unpleasant. Um, I think we have lost also, not that we are not going to regain it, but uh, momentarily, as it were, we have lost the stomach for unpleasant answers. Uh, again, uh, and this time without any joke, no, look at Brexit. I mean, uh, we really don't want to hear. We really do not want to listen to what's happening. Uh, independently of any position you want to take, I mean, the answers are coming. And uh, for either side, it may or may not be pleasant, but the thing is that either side doesn't want to get you know, that kind of information. So part of the operation that we should get into is uh, an acquired taste for questioning and some stomach for the answer we're going to get. Now, unfortunately, the right to be forgotten, I've been in, involved with that up here, so I can bore you to death on this. That, trust me, if you thought that this was boring, nothing compared to what I can do. Uh, so in this context, like uh, right away we've got in Google, etc., or oh, the GDPR, I'm also you not know, the ethicist recommending framework, etc., to Brussels. In that context, what we have seen is um, when I was on the advisory board for the right to be forgotten, it was precisely that um, inability to copy your past. Now, don't get me wrong, some things in the past should stay in the past. A mistake is a mistake, and sometimes, no, job done. I don't want to see that no, kind of parking ticket not being regurgitated every year, say, oh, you put that best buddy. I say, I know, it's, it's done, it's finished. So there are things that we should 
not get over. At the same time, we are our past. And so this idea that anything can be constantly re-edited, which comes from th this, these objects, which are getting us into the habit of thinking, I put it there, I remove it. I write it, I rewrite it. I say so, but I can also unsay it. No. I tweeted something stupid, and I tweeted something else the day after anyway, because so, I'm Trump. Uh, so in that sense, yeah, that's terrible. But that idea of the um, reversibility of even in your life, well, it's something that we need to stop at some point. Uh, but it's part of our culture. Now, that cut and paste gets to a level of um, malleability of the world when you start thinking, I can recut and paste everything again and again and again. And by the time you're 52, you say, mm, no, no, some things are no longer, no, cutable and pasteable. No, no, you are who you are. So I particularly appreciate the fact that, you know, Alice may not like the, the, the answers, but she has to get used to it. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Fantastic. Yes, I think we have, um, Stefan, is it? Uh, just behind you, Andrew. Oh, sorry, this one here. Thank you very much for um, raising these rather complex issues. Um, I'm a subject specialist at the British Library, um, and um, it does raise some very interesting stuff like, we should not be asking what the questions are we, or what the answers are. We are seem to be looking for the correct questions or answers that fit in nicely with the social norm or the cultural norm. Maybe we should encourage people to look at um, many questions and many answers that are possible rather than just one set of answers and questions. And um, since I've come from a science background, the whole debate over what is evidence and what is not evidence and how does that, uh, how do we um, kind of evolve our questioning about knowledge as you rightly say, it lies at the heart of what we're doing. So maybe we should not be offering information services, maybe we should be offering questioning services. Um, so I think, in a way, your talk has uh, blown uh, the shark out of the water, really. Um, and I think the more we think about these things, the better. I have a big um, sort of thing about the need for neurodiversity, that we should respect all ways of thinking. And if it doesn't fit in with the uh, cultural norm, that should be seen as a positive advantage. If we had not had people like Einstein thinking outside the box, we would not have our intellectual revolutions of the 20th century. So I would just leave you with that comment. Oh, I, th I think that I, I agree with you, yes. Uh, and I, I think that, the, as any, every, many other people, um, the, we also, it's also important, at least as a self-reproaching moment, not to always emphasize just the questioning moment. It's too easy for a philosopher to say, oh, it's all about questioning, you know, it's a questioning. And you say, yeah, but one day you also want to get some answers. Uh, and, uh, and, and one day you also want to make sure that some answers are wrong. And uh, I still belong to that kind of Western civilization that believes, Einstein included, that no, uh, faster than light, that is scientifically untenable. And that's not like a matter of, uh, oh, BBC style, on the one hand, on the other hand. No, there's no other hand. Uh, uh, and so we shouldn't compare, as I was saying before, astronomy and astrology, and anyone has uh, an opinion, because that's the end of toleration. It's when toleration becomes so open-minded that undermines itself by allowing the intolerant to run the business. I mean, John Locke already knew that. Huh? So that was the, the thing that we learned from the political context. As, however, in terms of uh, having an enormous amount of space where diversity of opinions is sane, not insane, is healthy, not unhealthy, absolutely. But that, for example, exclude you know, you know, things like intelligent design, uh, exclude things like Trump, exclude, I won't say anything else <laughs> otherwise, but no, exclude, in my view, you know, a number of other things uh, that were uh, something in something kind of reasoning. Uh, um, so, emphasis on questioning, absolutely, because I'm worried about who is controlling that initial step. Anything else? I can get away with a quotation from uh, uh, Oscar Wilde, to play gently with ideas. 
you knew better. No. I think we have time for him. Yes. Should I? Sorry. Oh, oh Stephen. Where are we? Oh. Yes, I, I think my, my question might be slightly related to the previous one. And, and you, you made a reference uh, at the beginning of your talk to, to experts, and maybe experts in inverted commas. Uh, and I'd like to know exactly, perhaps, what is the role of experts? Because on the one hand, experts might be perceived as the sort of people who want to control the questions. But on the other hand, experts might also be the sort of people who can actually help us, uh, either as individuals or as information professionals, to frame the questions. So maybe experts play a dual role, and are there perhaps different sorts of experts? I mean, I'd, I'd like to, to know perhaps what you think about sure. that. I think we come from, uh, uh, especially in philosophy uh, of knowledge, epistemology so-called, we come from a tradition where we didn't have that nuance distinction between someone who knows and someone who is an expert. So the, 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 the standard view was that either you do know or you don't know and that's all the problem. But how much and how better someone can know has been left on one side for a long time. Now I, I think that that's no longer true and we do have, especially if we want to play with this little sort of Q&A kind of a, a mechanism, we do have a way of understanding who an expert is and how someone can be more expert about something than someone else, because no one is an expert. Uh, being an expert is more like um, uh, being tall. Uh, if you are alone, you're not tall, you're just that size. You, you're tall in the sense that you're taller than someone else. So someone is an expert only because he, he or she knows more than someone else. But what does that mean? It means that uh, there's an increasing number of questions that that person can answer to. So suppose I know that there is a glass on the table. That's all I know. And if you ask me any other question about, oh, why is there a glass? I don't know. That's all I know. But maybe there's an expert on the glass on the table. And says, oh, because that's, that's where glasses are. And, he goes, and so the, the Einstein moment is where you have an increasing number of questions you are able to answer on topics that may just the simple knower or someone just informed would just tell you, I don't know, the train leaves from this platform at that time. And there is no other question I can answer on that. Whereas the person at the railway station who is an expert on their train will tell you much more. What kind of train? Is he always late? Is he in time? Is that the right platform? Does he leave sometimes from another platform? I don't know. I just know that the train leaves from there to there. But no, the railway guy who is an expert will have a, bound of, a boundless sometimes so number of questions that he or she can answer. So at that point, a comparative analysis is no longer between the experts and the known expert. It's about taller or less tall people, now, people who have an ability to answer more and more questions on the topic, and less and less. And therefore, I delegate to those who have basically longer legs uh, on that particular topic. If you ask me about inflation, all I know is not, it's not doing very well. But then the next question that you ask me, I'm going to delegate to an economist, because I have no idea. So, that is the kind of game that we should start uh, having in town, whereas, unfortunately, we play the old game, as in people who know and people who don't. And those who don't got upset. I think we have one final question, if we may. Um, I'm a subject librarian at Manchester Met University. Um, I just wanted to ask you, in this turbulent political climate that we're in, where we've got some quite controversial political figures in the world... I'm not sure I'm, I'm actually listen, no, I'm, uh, hearing correctly. So, oh. try again. That's, that's quiet. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Um, in the current turbulent political climate that we're in and the controversial political figures that we've got in the UK and America at the moment, um, you would think that someone like Carla Hayden would be perfectly placed with her status and the kinds of resources she's got at her disposal to counterbalance the politics that are going on in America at the moment. But that might be in tension with her position so it might be controversial for her to do so. What do you think about that? That a lot of us might feel that contradicting the political norms might um, actually cause ructions. Yes, I mean, I, I, if I got your, your point, uh, and please tell me if I, if I didn't. Um, I mean, asking questions is always, um, at some point, annoying. From the little kid, why, why, why? Like that. So, shut up. Like, that's, that's the way it is. That's it. That's, uh, that, at some point, 
I mean, just, uh, or the philosopher, who ends up badly. I mean, Socrates included. Because if you start questioning, like, that kind of annoying little fly that is constantly sort of uh, pinching you to, uh, you know, to go one step further, to be more of an expert on that thing, well, then at some point, someone somewhere in the society decides to you know, make sure that that voice is silenced. Uh, without being too dramatic, I think we should be asking more and more questions, especially when the questions uh, are addressing potential answers that reverberate on all of us. So it's not just an academic question. So, so in this context, um, the only comment I have on your particular point, which I'm, again, I'm, I'm sure I didn't um, misunderstood, is, is the following. In the game of question and answer uh, that we have introduced and play a little bit uh, today, there are societies where questioning is not allowed. And um, last time I checked, there's more than 50% of governments on this planet. Democracy not being a widespread phenomenon, just in case anyone no, have forgotten. You ask the wrong question about the king, the wrong question about the, that particular religion issue, the wrong question about that particular garment, and you are in trouble. So the kind of society I think we should live in, the, the, the good society, is not a society, of course, where questions are not being asked or cannot be asked, but it's not even a society in which all answers have to be given. And that's the mistake sometimes we make where sort of the interplay between transparency and opacity is seen as a win lose kind of situation. Of course, transparency everywhere. Opacity, never. Not true. Think of how we vote, for example. Anyone should be enabled and free to ask me whom I voted for without running into any trouble. And I should have the right not to say anything. Uh, so a society in which any question is allowed, but some answers are not necessarily you know, given, well, that's the society in which you want to live, not that asymmetric relationship. Now, back to your point, I think that society, we're not there yet. Uh, you know, perhaps here, perhaps in another you know, couple of corners, but certainly on planet Earth, it's not happening yet. But no, we need to push forward. Yeah. And I'm afraid I think we, we probably have to close there. Thank so you. Please join me in saying a huge thank you to Professor <laughs> Luciano Floridi. Thank you very much. Thank you. Fantastic. I just have two uh, or three very brief announcements uh, to make before we go into the break. Um, just to let you know that at 5.10 uh, this afternoon, we have an exciting launch, which is our newest special interest group, uh, the Knowledge and Information Management SIG. Uh, so please do join us downstairs for that launch. Uh, also, uh, Professor Floridi's talk today marks the beginning of an 18-month project that we are launching to review uh, the code of ethics for our profession. Uh, and and so that process of review and reflection begins tomorrow morning. Uh, who doesn't want to talk about ethics over breakfast? Uh, so we have an ethics uh, breakfast, and I hope as many of you as possible will come along for that. Um, finally, uh, it's uh, with great pleasure that I can announce uh, the publication of a new book uh, that's been produced by our friends at Lawrenceburgs, um, which is looking back uh, over the fact that we are now this year celebrating the 20th anniversary of the People's Network, that transformative step of putting free public internet access into every public library. And so to celebrate that, Lawrenceburgs have produced a book, uh, and there's a copy for everyone downstairs on the reception desk. So please, during the break, do go and take your copy. But uh, for the time being, thank you, have a great break, uh, and we'll see you at the reception tonight. Thank you very much.